morning, and this is Business Morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And I'm Ladi Williams. Good morning. We we'll begin with the latest uh, developments on the Nigerian downstream oil sector. The federal government has approved the release of $1.5 billion for the immediate uh, rehabilitation of the Port Harcourt uh, refinery at a briefing after the 38th uh, virtual meeting of the council chaired by uh, President Mohamed Buhari. The Minister of State for of Petroleum, uh, Timmy Pia Silva, said that the contract awarded to an Italian company will be carried out in three phases. According to him, the funding already is already in place. It's drawn from the uh, three components. The NNPC internally generated revenue, uh, monetary allocation provisions, as well as the Afrexim Bank. He also gives the assurance that before the end of the current administration, work would commence on the Wari and Kaduna refineries. Do take a listen. The Ministry of Petroleum Resources presented a memo on the rehabilitation of Port Harcourt refinery uh, for the sum of 1.5 billion, and that memo was 1.5 billion dollars, and it was approved by Council today. So we are happy to announce that the rehabilitation of Portacourt refinery will commence forthwith. Uh, it is in three phases. The first phase is to be completed in 18 months, which will take the refinery to a production of 90% of its name plate capacity. Uh, the second phase is to be completed in 24 months and all the final stage will be completed in 44 months. On the other very germane question about operations and maintenance, that has been a big problem for our refineries, as we all know. Um, that was also exhaustively discussed in Council, and the agreement is that we are going to put an a professional Operational, operations and maintenance company to maintain uh, the refinery, to manage the refinery when it has been rehabilitated. In any case, it is actually one of the conditions precedent by the lenders because the lenders say they can only give us the money if we have a professional operational and maintenance company. Discussions are ongoing. We want to take one at a time. And I want to assure you that before the lifetime of this administration expires, work on all the refineries would have at least commenced. Honestly, I really don't see any sense in this move. $1.5 billion, billion, that's a dollars. lot of money for a government that is looking for, uh, for money to take care of the economy. Why can't yeah. they sell off the refinery to private owners who private will probably sector, pop in yeah. their own money? and uh, deal with the refinery and then they channel this money to some other development mm -hmm. uh, developmental projects rather than exactly. you know pushing it to rehabilitation of a refinery we've been talking about rehabilitating refineries so for a very long years. time and so we've not years. achieved anything and who monitors these things anyway exactly. so it's better you build a new refinery then we see what you're doing but when you talk about rehabilitation mm -hmm. i don't know how they monitor that and how that is achievable. But yeah. we'll keep I'm hoping in my lifetime at least Nigeria will refine oil. Okay, we'll see I'm, how I'm that goes. But that happens. <laughs> all right. In the meantime, the House of Representatives has mandated its committee on petroleum to investigate an alleged uh, diversion of crude oil at Worry Refining and Petrochemical Company in Delta State. Its resolution is sequel to a motion sponsored by Honorable Ben Ibaba representing Ethiopia Federal Constituency of Delta State. The lawmaker also mentioned that the plant, which was uh, mandated to produce refined products from mainly local crude, has had several shutdowns due to haul challenges caused by continued neglect in the evacuation of products by the Petroleum Products Marketing Company. The House has adopted the motion and asked the committee to report back to it in four weeks for further legislative action. And the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Oweala, says Nigeria needs to transit from an oil-dependent economy into one that diversifies its economy through trade. 
Deputy Obosa, who was speaking at a meeting with women entrepreneurs in the country, is challenging women entrepreneurs to tap into the various interventions of government to boost trade, uh, create jobs and income. Do take a listen. The past few days has seen the Director General of the World Trade Organization, Dr. Ungozi okonjo Iwela, meeting with top government officials on how to diversify the nation's economy from oil. And this time, it's the turn of women entrepreneurs in the country. Her agenda for them includes harnessing the interventions of government to improve their livelihood, improved packaging, and the production of goods and services that can compete favorably in the international market. We have to begin to think of the transition of this economy and what space we need. We have to map that out to the world to make this transition. Two decades, three decades. But if we don't start now, we'll be in trouble. And that really bothers me. Statistics from the United Nations Entity for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women shows that the gender financing gap in Africa is about $42 billion, with men having the upper hand. But the Nigeria Export Promotion Council plans to introduce incentives to boost exports, especially for women. We are now about to launch the Export Development Fund, which has remained dormant for decades due to lack of funding. This pre-shipment uh, pre incentive is bound to boost export activities, mostly among our MSMEs and SMEs. Dr. Ungozi okonjo Wela takes her time to inspect some products produced by women entrepreneurs. <laughs> She concludes her official visits to Nigeria by addressing some of the key areas that her organization will be collaborating with the federal government on. How will we earn a foreign exchange? What will we produce and export? What will create jobs? And that's why issues like this exhibition by NEPC and the ministry, where we see so many women entrepreneurs, SMEs, producing quality products, if I may say so. It wasn't always like that, but what I saw today told me we are well on our way. Her visit is timely, as the federal government is working on improving the economy and some of her suggestions could prove vital to the government's plan. And talking about Nigeria's economic development, health, the say, is wealth. And when it comes to healthcare, Nigeria is lagging its comparable African neighbors in terms of expenditure and access. For example, Nigeria's public spending on healthcare amongst um, um, others, just about 3.89% um, of its um, uh, $495 billion GDP, that's according to the figures from the World Bank, compared to 8.25% in South Africa and 5.17% in Kenya. And a recent report from real estate consultancy Knight Frank says Nigeria would require about 386,000 additional beds and $82 billion of investment in healthcare real estate assets to reach the global average. Also, Nigeria's 206 million population is expected to almost double by 2050. That's according to the UN, which would see it become the third most populous country in the world. And so, how can investment be driven in the healthcare system? Dr. Ni Osamului, Chairman LCCI Medical Group uh, joins us now. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osamilui, for joining us on the program. Good morning. Good morning. Well, COVID-19... No Good morning. Doubt. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. COVID-19, no doubt, exposed the infrastructure gap in the healthcare sector. It is clear that the government alone cannot provide all the health needs of the citizens. We are talking about over 200 million people here. The private sector has a major role to play to complement government investment in health. Let's begin by looking at an overview of private sector experience in health services. How good or challenging is it to be an investor in the Nigeria health um, sector? Uh, this, of course, would include um, hospitals, diagnostics, and pharmaceutical. All right. Thank you so, so much um, for having me once again. So you've, you've, set, you've set um, the background. 
the government already realizes that the it cannot do it alone. A few years ago, um, 2001, governments, African Union government in Nigeria, Abuja, there was the Abuja Declaration where they talked about 15% of their budget being allocated to healthcare. But we all know that has not happened. If we have to do it, that's 15%. Nine of them which is, is required. In fact, in services, private sector um, provides about 60% but around uh, set a, a background, background to look at what the healthcare um, landscape is like. So, We need to demand side of things in healthcare. All right, uh, Mr. Osamilu, you will soon seem to be having issues there with your bandwidth. Um, but we really would want to hear from you. So we take a quick time out and then we get that sorted out and we come back to you. Let's take a quick time out now. <music> All right, you're still watching Business Morning on Channels Television, and we're looking at investing in the health um, care sector, and we're talking to Dr. Ni Osami Louie, Chairman, LCCI Medical Group. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Osami Louie. Yes, you're talking about, um, you know, the issues of um, um, health um, care investment uh, with the private sector. Now, looking at the population, of course, over 200 million people, uh, which should ordinarily be a market uh, for healthcare investment. How much of effective demand is the population, you know, offering investors in this sector? Excellent. So, like I said, um, when we look at healthcare, we have to look at three main areas. We have to look at the demand side of things, we have to look at the supply side of things, and we have to look at the environment. Of course, when we look at the demand side of things, we'll be talking about the market. When we look about the supply side of things, we'll be talking about what you mentioned earlier, the hospitals, um, which provide primary, secondary, and tertiary um, care. We'll be talking about the diagnostics. We'll be talking about the pharmaceutical companies and the medical equipment um, manufacturers. And then we will talk about the environment, of course. Demand side, which is really, really critical, and government as a whole. So you've mentioned 200 million people, 200 million people. On the, when you look at it, it's a potential market. But the actual fact is that the ability to pay most payments for healthcare in Nigeria that today is out of pocket. So you're seeing 200 million people, but you're not seeing 200 million people that have the ability to pay. So in actual fact, the market is not there. The market is not there. And, and this is something... So the government has, is very usual. And, and what can the government do? Insurance, health insurance. But, so there has been some progress. Now we, we've been talking about 5% coverage of health insurance. Remember, I'm talking about demand. We will talk about supply. Then we'll talk about the environment, the business environment. So before you even bring money for the supply side of things, to build an hospital, for a diagnostic center, for a pharmaceutical company, let's look at what the landscape, what the demand is like. To accelerate demand, to increase the, to increase demand, government needs to fix health insurance. We've been talking about five percent coverage for years. So this five percent is around maybe three million in the organized private sector, another three million of government civil servants. Then maybe about five to six million people that are covered under the state health state-based health insurance um, schemes, like you have in Lagos and, and some other states. So we're talking about maybe about twelve million. In Nigeria, this are, so meaning when people go to the hospital, they don't have the ability to pay. Again, under demand. So apart from the absolute number of number of people that are covered by health insurance, we have to look at what are the things that are covered under health insurance. So a lot of specialized procedures, all that kind of things, like kidney, um, dialysis, um, the, the coverage is minimal. 
transplant, a lot of things are not management of cancer. A lot of things are not currently covered by health insurance. So we talked a little bit about demand. That demand is not the ability to pay is there. What are the attitude of people to healthcare? Where do people first go when they have a problem? Do, you go, do they go to the pharmacist um, in their neighborhood? Do they go to an hospital? What is the behavior? What is that demand like? So let's talk a little bit about um, the supply side of things. So supply side, you'll be talking about hospitals. You'll be talking about pharma. You'll be talking about medical equipment and things like that. The environment, you will talk about what challenges do people operating in Nigeria have? What can government do? So we're saying this before you bring money in to invest. What are the people that are even in the market currently facing? The people in the market, um, the people in the space, the people in the sector, members of the LCCI. People, what are they facing? You find a lot of friction, a lot of duplication of responsibilities. And we keep talking about me medical tourism, people go out, going out. So I'll, I'll give you one, one example. Talking about the environment. Now, NADAC Safeguarding the health of Nigeria, fantastic job. Very, very important agency of government. SON, Standards Organization of Nigeria, also fantastic organization. Very, very important organization. However, you find out that in regulating um, healthcare industry, there's a lot of duplication of responsibilities. For example, medical devices. So we're talking about investment. You build a specialist hospital and you want to do Cardiac operations, highly specialized cardiac op operations like stents, um, bypass. You want to do bypass procedures, procedures. You want to be able to insert pacemakers and other things. You know, you want to invest into healthcare. You want to reduce medical tourism because people are going to Asia, etc., taking their money out, and you want to do this. And you don't have these devices, medical devices that you, you we don't we don't make them in Nigeria. You need to bring them in. All right, so, Dr. You, you brought them in. Can I go on? Uh, Did so you interject? We've actually run out of time. You know, because of time, we'll have to have this uh, conversation uh, some other time. But thank you so much for uh, your time this morning. Thank you for joining us. All right, uh, we'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll be looking at the commodities uh, markets. Do stay with us. We we'll begin this segment uh, with the oil, global oil market update as prices dropped for a fifth day today after official data showed a sustained rise in U.S. crude and fuel inventories while the ever-present pandemic clouded the demand outlook. Brent crude was down 12 cents at $67.88 a barrel after dropping by 0.6% on Wednesday. U.S. oil was also down 12 cents at um, $64.48 a barrel, having fallen 0.3% the previous session. Our government data on Wednesday showed U.S. crude inventories have risen for four straight weeks after refineries in the South were forced to shut due to severe cold weather an industry report estimated a 1 million barrel drop had raised hopes the run of gains might have stopped. U.S. crude inventories increased by 2.4 million barrels last week. An industry report on Tuesday estimated a 1 million barrels decline. Analysts had, on average, expected an increase of 3 million barrels. Okay. All right, let's talk more on commodities there with Dami Lola Akemami, Head of Research at Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, Dami. Good, Good, Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see I you. would like to start this conversation with this um, latest one coming from the federal government, $1.5 billion for rehabilitation of um, refinery. Why do we do one step forward, one step backwards? It's absurd, isn't it? Well, um, let's get some facts straight. One, like you rightly said, the federal government has approved $1.5 billion for the rehabilitation of the Portacot refinery. Another fact is that Nigeria has four refineries. None are working. Another fact is that Nigeria imports all of its refined crude oil because, like I just said, none of the refineries are working. So we have a huge um, import bill that is focused or spent 
on importing refined crude. And what the government has decided to do is to rehabilitate or re re repair the refineries instead of selling them to um, private investors. So basically what the government is going to be experiencing is more increased burden on its fiscal position. This Absolutely. is a country that has been severely challenged as a result mm -hmm. of low oil prices, the pandemic, and we know that even our debt profile, the debt stock increased mm -hmm. to about 32.92 trillion at the end of December, which if you look at it, that's about 21, almost 22% of GDP, and based on the new borrowing limit that was increased to 40%, one would think or say that, oh, we're still within the threshold. But if you look at the debt service to revenue ratio, which is a more um, reflective in Decator. You see that Nigeria spends almost 70, 80 percent of its revenue on servicing debt. So mm -hmm. it's a huge, it's a major thing, and we would have expected that the government would actually take that the, the path of selling the refineries. Because it's yes, moving. rehabilitating is a good thing, but is there a better option? Yes, mm -hmm. there is a better option. And in the past, we've seen that the government has rehabilitated, re rehabilitated rather these refineries. And over it never and over works. Again. It never works. They would work, but uh, the major issue is actually mm -hmm. maintenance. Because if you repair something now. Definitely down the line with wear and tear, you will need to maintain it. So why, and again, the government doesn't even have the funds to be maintaining regularly. And that's why we are suggesting that sell these assets that are not functioning properly to the private sector. One, again, because the private sector, because they are profit oriented, so they have more incentive to ensure that yeah. these Absolutely. assets yeah. are working at optimal Yeah, they cannot capacity. put in their money there and not make it work yeah. exactly i mean we have the damage refinery now yes we hope it will come on board by next year there's mm -hmm. no way it will come on board and that refinery will not be maintained so yes. why can't you know these other refineries be channeled towards you know private um, sector initiative Yes, and the government has even hinted at the fact that it's going to continue to rehabilitate the other refineries because it also stated that by 2023, the Wari and the Kaduna refineries, the rehabilitation work would commence on this one. So the government has clearly stated what path it wants to take. But I'm sure down the line they may have everything because then your costs are going to continue to increase. And I'm sure this budget of about 13 trillion thereabouts, I don't think it was, um, would have factored in the cost of re repairing this refinery. So that means you have to look for other sources to fund this project. So $1.5 billion out of your external reserves, which have depleted to $34.5 billion, $1.5 billion, which could have been invested in other projects. So it's it's a major issue, and um, definitely we're going, yes, it's a big problem. Yeah. And more importantly, the debt service burden, because now nominal interest rates are increasing. You know, last year, because of the low interest rate environment, the government was able to benefit from that, and the cost of servicing the debt was, was minute. Mm -hmm. But as interest rates start to increase, then it becomes more expensive to service the debt. And at what point does the government actually say, okay, you know what, we can't keep borrowing? Uh, when, would, when do we get to that threshold? So you see, borrowing is not necessarily no, a bad thing. thing. Yes. 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 So it's actually it's... what you're going to use those proceeds for. What are you exactly. borrowing? Are, are you borrowing for recurrent expenditure? Mm -hmm. or are you borrowing to fund capital projects that have that investment multiplier that would now boost economic growth and development? So I think that is the issue, not necessarily when the government will stop borrowing. Because mm -hmm. countries borrow, mm -hmm. whether developed or emerging. Well, countries will always true. borrow. So it, more importantly, what are you using it for? Mm -hmm. Is it going to channel? Is it going to utilize? Is it going to unlock more opportunities, more job creation opportunities, mm -hmm. more investment. That is the issue. Okay. Now, we, we where the government is looking for money, they don't have revenue, and they have, talking about $1.5 billion uh, dollars mm -hmm. for uh, rehabilitation of refinery, and here we are, oil price still coming down. Well, from what I read today from the oil market, some analysts saying, well, we might be seeing that bearish trend for, you know, for now. So with what we are seeing, what will now be the implication for the market, including OPEC, you know, itself. And of course, here, here we are, Nigeria. Nigeria mm. And yes. particularly our downstream sector. <laughs> Maybe we will now see petrol price come down, isn't it? Is it possible? <laughs> well, it is, it is possible because, again, I'll start from the end. It's, it's possible because mm. if the market is truly deregulated, so mm. if oil prices decline, then we should see um, a resultant decline in petrol prices. But bear in mind that that is not just oil prices that are con considered when um, looking at um, the cost of oil in terms of the landing cost. You also look at the exchange rates and other things. So, again, back to oil prices. It's, it's a commodity, and like all commodities, it's volatile. And right now, the global oil market is very fragile. 
So the slightest hint of any news development will move the, the price in whatever direction. So yes, some analysts would say that it's a little bit bearish or they have a bearish um, forecast about oil prices. But I think for, the, for, for this year, we're looking at oil prices trading at an average of about 60 to $65 per barrel. For Nigeria, that is good news in one, on, one, on one hand in terms of, yes, the federal and the state governments, they have more revenue to meet the outstanding obligations. And also we know that definitely your external reserves, so the CBN is, will be able to build up on its external reserves and mm. support the local currency. But on the other hand, like we've, we've talked about um, refineries and what have you, and the fact that Nigeria imports its refined crude. So definitely um, ref, uh, our import bill on refined crude would increase as long as oil prices remain elevated. So, but now with oil prices at 67, it's still, uh, uh, it's still relatively high compared to our production levels, which are about 1.4 four, nine, there are about million barrels per day. Yeah. But so we expect that these high oil prices would offset the low production and levels for Nigeria. So by and large, so that's the good and the bad side. So mm. that, again, it just reiterates the fact that we need to start having our own refineries so mm. that we don't have to import. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that, so, that, that brings to the question I would always want to ask. <laughs> yes, we are seeing our reserve drop. Mm. Nigeria is dealing with high inflation rate and we have high unemployment rate. Dami, please tell me, should we be crying, <laughs> praying, or even <laughs> clapping? Which one? <laughs> I think as long as there is life, there is hope. So, mm. but with that said, yes, we have a lot of things uh, working both for and against the economy. Mm. So, what do you do? So, basically, the, the policy authorities just need to be strategic. On one hand, yes, inflation is increasing. Yes, external reserves are depleting. But then, what is the government doing about it? And we, talk, we talked about um, or, um, petroleum products. It's not just petrol. Kerosene, diesel, mm. and all these uh, have a strong correlation with food inflation. In diesel, for instance, that's the fall that the trucks that move the commodities from the markets to the, to the, I mean, from the farmland to the markets used. Kerosene is used also as a form of a cooking fuel. So all this would impact on inflation. We, unemployment rates have increased also. So the average Nigerian is, is challenged at this point. So what, what can the government do? Invest in key projects that would unlock opportunities, broaden the value chain, invest in the education sector, not necessarily in terms of universities. We hear some of, of t today, oh, so many number of universities are being are given accreditation license to start operating. But what about the vocational schools? Because not everyone is going to be a doctor, not everyone is going to be a lawyer. But we also need people that could also be, in, for instance, farmers. Or is there any value chain in the, in the agricultural space? Not just in the production, but what about processing? What about packaging? Mm -hmm. We talked about the blockade at a point in time. Mm -hmm. And one major issue is um, um, packaging. Because perishables, if they're not processed, um, I mean, if they're not kept properly, you would lose the value. So is there an investment in the packaging um, aspect, for instance, of agriculture? Look at the enabling environment. What about access to credit? Are the interest rates at a relatively low enough level, even if interest rates are low, because that's what the central bank has been trying to do. Okay, fine, interest rates are low, but then still lending rates are still relatively high. The interest rates are low are more on the deposit aspect. So I think, again, just co combining, and it's not just monetary policy or fiscal policy, it's supposed to be a combination of all these policies and having a forward-thinking mentality. And I think, again, it's not, things are not done overnight. You have to make that gradual step and have a positive direction. And I'm I talking think, about yes. uh, interest rates. The U.S. Mm. Fed has said they will mm. not actually raise, yes. you know, interest rates. So what, what does that mean for commodities markets and also Nigeria? So how is it even possible? I mean, they are talking about because of the stimulus uh, package, stimulus package yeah. because yeah. there's inf uh, going to be inflation, yes, and then inflation. Yes. they're saying they're not. So each country has the rates. unique features, mm. and a lot of countries actually kept their interest rates at a very low level because of the pandemic, and mm. they were releasing a lot of stimulus packages injecting the economy with a lot of funds just so as to stimulate that recovery process. Now, the U.S., as expected, has kept interest rates at near zero, and they plan to do that in 2024, or at least when the economy reaches full employment or around um, 2%, which is the federal um, U U.S. Fed Reserve's um, inflation target. So 
after that announcement yesterday, what happened to the dollar? The dollar weakened. The U.S. dollar index fell by about 0.5%. And what that means for commodities, because commodities are priced in dollars. So because the dollar has weakened, it makes these commodities cheaper and more affordable. So the demand for the commodities increase, and likewise the price. So in a way, it's a good thing for um, commodities. But the, the, the U.S. Fed was very optimistic about the U.S. economy. It increased its growth forecast to about 6.5% from 4.2% that was earlier projected in December. It has also increased its projections about inflation, that inflation will get to about 2.2 before receding to about 2%. And it has even reduced its unemployment figure. So the, the basic, definitely there are um, improved prospects about the U.S. economy. The U.S. is a major market globally and even for Nigeria in terms of diaspora remittances, mm. in terms of investment. So definitely Nigeria stands to benefit from the U.S. economy recovering. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the week is um, almost yes. getting <laughs> to almost the over. End. Okay, let's look at the price movement now. Can you take us through this domestic price movement and um, the outlook for agri commodities in particular, and of course, um, oil. Yes, so um, domestic commodity prices are mixed and we are seeing some of them declining and some of them um, actually um, staying elevated to so the likes of beans and flour that we expect to increase to 15,000 naira by April 1. And we expect that as Easter approaches that this, um, some of, most of these commodity prices are going to increase and they're going to stay elevated even for um, the rest of Q2, especially as we enter um, the peak of the planting season. And for all, um, for the rest of the week, we expect all prices to trade around current levels so between 67 to probably 70 dollars and like i mentioned earlier again the market is very fragile so any new development will definitely move the price in whatever direction but then the market is oversupplied but the um, the opec cuts the voluntary cuts by saudi arabia this um, gradual recovery in asian forward demand these are some of the factors that are going to help to boost the price of oil in the near term all right thank you very much uh, dami thank you very much for having thank me you. thank you time. Okay, we take a moment. I will be back. All right, let's look at um, the markets now with um, Eddie Jong, Erwan. Well, the equities market back in the red, Eddie. Yes, Jimmy, you're right. Although it was marginally, though, so maybe we use that to console ourselves. It wasn't a, a steeper loss in the market yesterday. The all share index was down 0.04%, uh, 38,706.13 points. But I'm going to talk more about this with Kayade Olayemi, a stockbroker at TSL uh, Securities Limited. Good morning, Kayade. Thank you for joining us on the program. Good morning. Thanks for having me. So we saw the negative sentiments continuing the market yesterday, although marginally. What drove markets yesterday? What drove sentiment in the market? Okay, so um, yesterday, um, the session, the market was sort of flat. Uh, it was down by about four basis points, and it was mixed across the sectors. Uh, we saw the financials were down. Um, industrials and consumers were flat, while the oil and gas sector was up. Um, for the oil and gas sector, what happened there is um, I look through your has uh, been on the steady rise. So that sentiment is sort of feeding through to the stock um, in that state, like the step up and then the one. For the bank, um, the consumer apprehension, um, given that there's no the key financial lenders that were still expecting the numbers. So those sort of sentiments are sort of weighed on the market um, in past few weeks. Uh, the data as well, in terms of um, unemployment and inflation, haven't been very positive as well, so um, sentiment has just basically been um, market. I know the market just started trading, you know, some minutes ago, but how uh, are sentiments as we speak? Are investors, you know, still uh, perturbed about the market? Um, at the moment, the market is looking up. Um, turnover in just the first 30 minutes already exceeds um, what we saw in all of yesterday's session. Um, so while the risk factors are still in place in terms of the state economic data rising um, yield, um, we'll probably still start to be to the bottom of this um, downward trend um, that we're, we haven't seen in the past a little bit. Um, if you look at some stuff that got to about the lowest levels um, in like six months yesterday, they had started to recover before the close of the session, and um, they're also sort of looking up um, at the moment. All right, Kaidi, thank you for your input on the program.
Kaide Olayemi is a stockbroker at CSL Securities. Now, we'll just move on to the markets now. We saw lower turnover of volume value and deals traded yesterday as volume was down by about 19% uh, at 177.39 million units, worth 2.67 billion, and all of that was traded in 4,103. The uh, sectoral performance was mostly negative, apart from the oil and gas sector, which gained 1.27%. And that was largely driven by gains on Oando and Seplat. I think Oando was up by about 9% yesterday. The banking sector was down 0.42%. We saw declines from FBN Holdings, GT Bank, and uh, Zenith Bank. The consumer goods sector was down marginally by 0.02%, and that was due to declines from Vitafoam. Industrial goods was unchanged, while insurance was down 1.03%. The Anisa Securities market was also negative yesterday as the NSI fell 0.45% to 703.67 points, while the market cap was at 500.17 billion naira. We saw about 10,563 deals, not a lot, uh, worth a uh, unit worth 153,000 naira traded in one deal. Now, to talk more about the fixed income market is Kaya Ewebi, a fixed income dealer at FSDH Merchant Bank. Good morning, Kaya. Thank you for joining us on the program. Well, I guess we've lost care there. Well, uh, the bond market was bearish yesterday. So I've seen this bearish run as it was down by nine, nine basis points. It was up by nine basis points to 9.4%. And across the curve, we saw yields expand at the mid and the short end. We had 12 deals worth 1.70 billion in that market. The Nigerian Treasury bills market was mixed as participants were focusing on the auction which was held yesterday. Hopefully, if we get care back, he will tell us more about the turnout you know, and how that will shape trading today. We had just six years worth 1.90 billion in the market. There was another, uh, we saw more activity at the CBN special bills market. 11 deals worth 29.50 billion naira. While the OMO market was uh, bearish, as we saw yields expand by six basis points, we saw 44 deals worth 127.09 billion naira. Now we saw a lot of activity on the February 2022 uh, maturity so today i mean it's expected that investors you know will still try to you know cover up for lost bids at the auction yesterday which was oversubscribed by the way uh, we saw yields increase in that space but we'll see how that shapes you know trading for the rest of the week and into next week with everyone focusing on the npc's meeting and waiting to see what the the cbn will do so chimmy I think, just have to um, perhaps, I think that's, uh, perhaps that's the, the next catalyst that will probably uh, mm -hmm. decide what happens in either market, whether the equities market or the fixed income market. Thanks, Eddie. All right, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we cross over to London.
right, let's bring in um, Juliana on board to bring us up to speed with um, developments in London. Good morning, Juliana. Good to see you. Well, the U.S. Fed yesterday left rates unchanged. How are investors in the U.K. chewing that decision? And um, what, are they, what are the expectations from the Bank of England uh, as it meets today? Yeah, good morning, Chimmy. I think um, investors here are still mulling over the Fed's pretty uh, calm response to the rising uh, bond yields. Um, they've changed their outlook, their projected outlook for U.S. economy growth this year up uh, from 4.2% to 6.5%. One of the issues with growth is that it does mean higher inflation, and that's what the market anxiety has been over the past couple of months. We've got our own anxiety, as you said. The Bank of England are meeting today. We're expecting a decision at 12 o'clock on whether or not they'll change interest rates. We're not expecting that. Still at a current low, a 0.1% quantitative easing is at £895 billion. That's not expected to change either. Um, there have been lots of comments uh, by the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey, um, really just um, kind of praising our vaccine rollout scheme. Currently in the UK, 49% of the adult population have received a vaccine, way and above all of our other European competitors, which does mean um, economic growth um, will come out alongside of us coming out of this uh, third national lockdown. So we're not expecting any changes, but the minutes are going to be very, very important because, of course, with growth comes higher inflation. Um, so that's going to be taking place at 12 o'clock. Hopefully, I'll be able to give you an update on Bizinc. Absolutely, you will do that. Uh, in the meantime, the government plans to make it easier to claw back bonuses paid to executives of failed companies in what is being billed as the biggest shakeup of Britain's corporate governance rules in decades, with ministers vowing to target negligent uh, auditors and uh, whom they call rogue directors. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, this is um, going to uh, this is going to lead to a lots of changes in the corporate governance setup of the UK, which is really dominated by the big uh, four accountancy firms. They've been accused of sleeping at the wheel over the past couple of years um, because there have been major collapses. There's the BHS collapse, the Arcadia Group, uh, Carillion, Thomas Cook, which was a 178-year-old corporate um, uh, tour operator. And one of the issues with some of these major companies is when they collapse. A lot of um, shareholders and um, the owners or the CEOs are getting massive uh, payouts. And uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, the new business secretary, wants to put an end to this. There is going to be a 16-week consultation just looking at how um, within contracts uh, they can make sure that if a massive corporate collapse does take place, then that um, a lot of these um, big fish don't get big uh, payouts, um, which cost um, job losses and um, lots of loss and suffering. They also want to crack down on the dominance and the market share of the big four um, audit uh, firms. Currently, they have a massive um, overhaul of the FTSE 350. Most of the big companies go to them uh, for accountancy advice. Um, but there have been major mistakes, which is part of why um, this consultation um, is happening. Mm. And Scotland's railways will be nationalised next year. The railways currently are run by Abellio. So why the nationalisation now? Yeah, well, um, as we've seen in England, over the past 12 months or so, um, Scott Rail has already been um, franch well, been nationalised by the Scottish government. They had to take it on because one of the ways that these rail uh, franchises make money is through passengers and fares. And um, some um, commutes have plunged by about 98%. This was the same in Scotland. I believe the government have forked out about £458 million just to make sure the service keeps running. Um, and Abellio have had problems before uh, the pandemic. They've been in, they've been criticised basically just uh, through lack of um, not delivering the service that they have been promising. So their contract has been terminated early. And yesterday, um, during a Scottish um, session in Parliament, uh, they did announce that I believe by the end of next year, the Scottish government uh, will be finally taking it over. And it seems to have been uh, widely uh, received and praised. All right, thank you very much, um, uh, Juliana. You'll be talking to Ladi later in the day and give us all the update. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. All right, let's look at the crypto market. Uh, well, Ladi, earlier this week, um, your 
coin pick for this week was yep. ZRX, ZRX and um, yes. it's rising this it's actually, morning. What's yeah, driving that? It's actually up this morning about 18%. Uh, I actually saw uh, that the MACD actually crossed bullishly for the one-day time frame and that's uh, looking at the technical indicators. So that's uh, one way in, uh, so traders if I, if I, actually... So if I chose to buy ZRX as at Monday... Yeah. So I would have gained. It'll be up today. like eighteen percent this morning. Mm. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> so you should actually watch the show to get such, uh, you know, updates. Uh, market cap one point eight one trillion dollars, up four point forty percent. Twenty four hour volume one hundred forty point five four billion dollars, up about six point six four percent. Let's uh, talk to Olumide addition on our hello Olumide. Great to have you. Uh, hello, Ladi. Nice good morning. On the show once again. Uh, good morning. Great to have you. So I see Bitcoin. Up this morning, $59,000. What's happening? Well, market prices are not surprised. Um, you know, prior to uh, the run, uh, something happened um, some hours ago. I'm talking about Morgan Stanley. You know, a bank of star repute that have assets of about $4 trillion is now exposing some of their wealthy clients to uh, Bitcoin. In fact, it had an internal memo to its financial advisors, stating that um, clients that have over two million dollars in assets and investment firms that have holdings of over five million can have access to Bitcoin, and that really triggered the bullish run. Then don't forget that yesterday the world's most powerful central bank, I'm talking of the U.S. Federal Reserve, concluded their monetary policy meeting, saying that they were going to keep um, the status quo the same, meaning that we should expect more uh, money in circulation. That also uh, triggered uh, the bullish run in Bitcoin. And now, uh, the third and, and the most important thing is that Bitcoin is becoming scarce. Uh, data from Glassman revealed that the amount of Bitcoin on crypto exchanges is currently about 2 million. And that is telling that um, the pressure, the buying pressure, is making the price appreciation uh, its record. So presently, Bitcoin is over at $58,500. But we are seeing that um, in start of the British by some of uh, the institutional investors are taking up their gains, you know. This is something that is normal. So we we, we, we will feel that uh, United will be the same in, in the next time. So it seems that it's still the institutional investors pushing uh, the price at this point. Uh, what about the retail? What's, what's retail doing? Uh, I, I think uh, the mystique most retail investors is that they don't have the uh, holding appetite, you know, the, the problem is that uh, Bitcoin is a very volatile asset, so any price swing, we're seeing that um, retail investors sell. And the funny thing is that as retail investors sell their positions, the institutional investors buy. Just recently, a Chinese uh, tech startup, um, which you get in Hong Kong, bought another $30 million worth of Bitcoin, announced it uh, some hours ago. So you can see that amid Bitcoin scarcity, this is just investors are looking at price patterns and buying at right position. So uh, the retail uh, participation is reducing yeah. and we are seeing more institutional players coming to play. Okay. All right, Lumide, what's the outlook for the weekend? Price of Bitcoin. Where do you see it going? Uh, outlook for, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit inclined to the fact that, uh, yeah, it's part of the bullish rally, but U.S. Treasury yield is already picking up and that is showing that inflation is on the rise. And you can see that risky assets like stocks are already going through price correction. So, how big the bullish rally is going on, I feel that at one point there will still be price correction because just recently the US dollar index is showing some gains and that will really put pressure at the bullish rally. So I'm not sure okay. uh, in the next time, yeah. But I'm bullish okay. All right, this year for Bitcoin. Thank you. Okay. Well, let me yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Always great to have you. Thank you. All right. So top alt uh, by market cap BNB up this morning, $205, uh, up 8%. Uh, Cardano, ADA. $1.42 up 15%. ADA has actually uh, uh, passed the BNB in market cap this morning. So, Chimmy, that's how the market is looking right now. First, it was JP Morgan, and now it's uh, Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley. Well, institutional investors seem to be flooding that Bitcoin. And he just said the Bitcoin is even scarce. There's no non for retail mm. investors, <laughs> and they're not even willing or rather having that um, risk appetite yeah. to really hold yeah. in that um, on that asset. So yeah. perhaps uh, retail investors uh, will be more interested in the altcoins. You talked about the ZRX. Mm. Uh, should we continue to hold that? Yeah, well, yeah, because it's still on an uptrend at this moment. So it's, it's a good one to hold.
But mind you, laddie, this is not uh, financial not advice. Not financial <laughs> advice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. That's it on the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And I'm Laddie Williams. Thank you for watching.